Um, welcome to the final uh, panel discussion of this uh, tr rather tremendous meeting on mathematics for the modern economy. I'm here with my, uh, I'm Julian Hunt, um, and uh, my panelists are Dr. Ruth Kernan, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Mariana Brazza from Toulouse, and, and Professor Bond. I have a few points to make, summarizing some points made already at this conference and my own experiences in industry, environment, and political organizations. Um, my first comment is that as we've seen today, and as Professor Park, for example, uh, uh, showed us from Korea, a much wider range of mathematics have become applicable in industry, environment, and government. There has been a wider perception, the second point is there's been a wider perception and, and uh, greater public understanding of new mathematical and statistical ideas and techniques. Now, uh, an example of this perhaps was the Queen's, our Queen's question in 2008, when she went to the LSE after the great financial slump. And she asked the question, can the functions of government become more predictable? Uh, on the other hand, more recently, the US President, Mr. Trump, had a different objective. He wanted to make his government deliberately unpredictable. Um, so one of this is rather an interesting mathematical question, I, and I believe you can't make a government unpredictable because there will always be rather a lot of history of what they did before. But uh, this raises a new question for GCHQ and the government, probably. The other feature which we've particularly seen today is the huge growth of computation and more than 100 petaflops uh, per second, enabling fundamental understanding of processes, such as turbulence, which is one of my uh, great interests, um, but also leads to more accurate, faster uh, practical models, uh, including uh, the media, as we have just seen. So now I should like to ask the panelists to give their own perspectives um, uh, as they will lead off uh, the discussion. And we we'll begin with uh, Dr. Ruth Kona. OK, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Good. So as this is the last session of the day, I thought I'd be a little bit provocative so that we, we end on a a lively note. And I was um, particularly struck in the previous presentation by this idea of going from decades to seconds and thought, actually, that really resonates with my own experience. So 25 years in the pharmaceutical industry, and when I started out, my job was to try and invent a new treatment for anxiety. This was before the human genome had been sequenced. And what we knew and understood was that benzodiazepines, the standard treatment, had many different side effects, and our job was to find something that, that was good for anxiety but had no other side effects. Um, when the human genome came out, we found that the target for benzodiazepines wasn't one gene, one, one product, but actually more than 16. And I had to solve what were the real combinations of these 16 potential subunits, what existed in the brain, and what of those were responsible for anxiety. So these were two of my favorite papers, one in the Journal of uh, Biological Chemistry and one in one of the Nature Journals. And it requires a lot of simultaneous equations to tell us that, that there were really only half a dozen major types of which one was primarily responsible for anxiety. And that was probably a couple of years of work. Now, I work for Innovate UK. I'm the chief executive, and my job is to help grow businesses, to help them be productive, to help them really engage the future and create economic growth for the UK. And when I look at the treatments for anxiety that come across my desk, it's all about digital health. It's about understanding large amounts of data and predicting who has a mental illness and is likely to get worse, who is ready to be treated, looking at um, large amounts of data on how people interact with others and using facial recognition to say, is somebody depressed and is their treatment going to benefit them before they're aware of it? And now we're beginning to see things like uh, virtual reality and, and augmented reality as a treatment itself for anxiety. So when I started my career trying to treat people and invent drugs for anxiety, it was decades. 
and now we're using mathematics in seconds, using augmented reality to treat the very same conditions. That's how far we've come. That's my introduction, and I have a lot to say about how, um, how my agency, how Innovate UK, can help bring companies and mathematicians together to create economic growth. I should have mentioned, uh, introdu introduce you properly, that, uh, uh, that, that Ruth uh, um, has written a, an interesting book uh, as a science writer about uh, disease and yeah. research. Um, so now I'd like to turn to Dr. Mariana Brazza, uh, who is an international award-winning expert in aer aeronautics and fluid structure. Uh, she is from the Institute of Institut de Mécanique de Fluide de Toulouse, uh, and uh, I should also say she she br broke this great 300-year barrier in that she and Fra uh, she and her French colleagues came and presented at the Royal Society Summer Soirée a couple of years ago. Now, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Julian. Uh, thanks very much for this uh, very kind in invitation. Indeed, it is uh, the second time I have the honour to be here. Thank you. In, at the Royal Society, since the annual exhibition of 2014, where with my team we had uh, uh, presented uh, the demonstrator of uh, electroactive morphine for increasing the aerodynamic uh, performances of new uh, generation of aircraft. Uh, you can find uh, details about uh, this uh, platform. Uh, I, uh, coordinate in Toulouse in 3wsmartwing.org organization. And uh, we have uh, the opportunity since um, long years to have a collaboration with uh, Airbus Toulouse uh, concerning the design so the, uh, of the wings and um, high lift flaps of the future. Now, uh, concerning this um, event uh, here, I uh, have to say that uh, multidisciplinarity is uh, a very big deal in what all uh, of us try to do, because even coming from uh, aerodynamics, uh, we have found uh, ways how to um, uh, suggest uh, multidisciplinarity in uh, economic uh, systems inspired from thermodynamics, mathematical theories of turbulence, uh, in order to uh, better um, predict uh, uh, economic models and uh, better uh, control these models uh, through uh, the so-called uh, morphing. Morphing is just giving a form, a form concerning in respect of a, a wished uh, target focus. It is not only just control. And uh, uh, this inspiration uh, can come from uh, fluid mechanics, from uh, previous um, attempts, as um, I have to recall the lecture of Ilya Prigozhin Nobel Prize in 82 in uh, Toulouse uh, Super uh, where he uh, presented thermodynamic systems with um, irreversibility properties and the entropy increase, and he said, uh, uh, well, these uh, theories about uh, uh, time uh, becoming and uh, beginning and becoming, uh, f uh, in French I would say physique, temps et devenir. I'm sorry, I cannot translate very well this, but I'm sure you understand. Uh, this uh, modeling uh, can be uh, applied uh, in the modern economy uh, system. Uh, it is a boundary, uh, boundary um, condition system where uh, we have to prescribe uh, uh, suitably stochastic uh, boundary and in initial conditions uh, in order to go towards uh, more efficient, more highly predictable pre predictability properties of uh, current economy models. So uh, these last years, uh, thanks to collaboration with uh, Julian Hunt, uh, who uh, visits regularly us in Toulouse, we have been uh, inspired from meteorolog meteorology uh, con concepts of uh, mathematical modeling of turbulence, uh, where uh, we can manipulate uh, the turbulent structures by uh, uh, the so-called morphing, by re-injecting turbulence, uh, by putting 
means suitable vibrations, suitable controls, in order to uh, thin, thin in uh, the shear layers, preventing instabilities and uh, reducing drag, increase lift, uh, reducing noise. So all these uh, um, uh, concepts can be uh, multidisciplinarity speaking, uh, applied uh, thanks to math applied mathematics to modern uh, economy. And uh, in Toulouse, we have uh, um, a multidisciplinary action involving uh, econ the Toulouse Business School, the uh, Institut de Convergence of uh, Institut National des Sciences Appliquées, uh, my institute and uh, a couple of other institutes in turbulence uh, modelings and uh, thermodynamics, uh, which aim at this multidisciplinarity in the uh, topic of economy and uh, links, uh, linking with mathematics uh, in order to uh, do this uh, uh, coupling, not just uh, 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 juxtapose these uh, uh, speci specialties, but do multidisciplinary coupling. Uh, and uh, this can, uh, we are uh, sure that, that this can give quite promising uh, results. So we plan with Julian to organize specific meetings about this. Very topic. good. Thank you very much. And now uh, it's over to Professor Philip Bond, who has a wide range of uh, knowledge of applications of mathematics, and he also advises the Prime Minister. I'm sure what goes in is better than what comes out. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you for I, that. <laughs> uh, I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. It's First, let me say, it's, it's lovely to be here. I feel I'm, I'm amongst uh, friends and family in the math community, and I see some, some faces in the audience that I've known for many years. So thank you so much for coming along. I want to say a big thank you to Julian, and particularly to John Ockenden for organizing. And could I actually ask people to put their hands together for, for them? Because, I mean, what a fantastic oh, thing to do. Have they already, and I yes, wasn't yeah. there? Well, I'll do it again myself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a really special meeting. It, it's a really important meeting, and I really appreciate everyone who's, who's worked to it. So I was just asked to say a little bit about myself so you can get a, a little f a flavor of what I do. Then I want to talk about why I am passionate about the, the impact uh, of mathematics in the world around us. So I, I just um, peripatetically interested in absolutely everything, I think. So I did five degrees. One was in the physics, then I did finance, then applied math, French applied math, which includes a huge amount of things like differential geometry. And then, uh, then I did um, theoretical physics, more differential geometry, then pure math, which is differential and algebraic geometry and all that fun stuff. And um, I sit on the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology, where I'm the only person who's really a mathematician. And we talk a lot about STEM, but it kind of comes out like st a lot. And I go, m uh, quite a bit. Um, I'm very fortunate in, I, I've, I've had an association with Oxford uh, over the years and uh, I, was, I lectured there on cryptography and signal processing at one time and uh, I set two Guinness World Records for memorizing the number pi. Um, so, yep, I like, I like numbers, there you go. So I wanted to just talk about why does driving mathematics into the heart of, of, of the economy really matter to me? I mean, why am I passionate about it? And, and actually, it's, it's to do with living standards. It's to do with living standards. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, some economics. Over thousands of years, and remarkably enough, the Bank of England were, were ordered, the, the economists of the Bank of England were ordered by Andy Haldane, the chief economist, to check as far back in the historic record as they could. And he didn't care if they had to go to Suma to do it. Um, what, was the in, what was the impact of different things on the standard of living, how, how good is life, how good is, are the things that you have, how clean is your water, how good is your medicine, everything that you kind of care about. And it turned out that over an incredibly long period of time, just about all of the change in standard of living comes from productivity gains. And what you saw in that fantastic um, lecture we had a little bit earlier was you have um, the most stupendously enormous productivity gains in, thanks to this kind of digital technology, which is really, really important because 
Uh, the UK was actually leading uh, the G7 in productivity gains until the year 2008, and then we hit a brick wall, and we have had zero gain in productivity since then. So we're nearly at a decade of no growth. If you have no growth in productivity, you have no growth in living standards, and non pro grade yes, ray grady um, as you know, uh, people are starting to get very unhappy and society very stressed because things are not getting better. So I greatly, greatly care about it, and... One of the things that can change productivity is science and technology. In fact, if we actually look at the facts, uh, about 50% of all changes in productivity over a long, long period of time come about from either the creation of new technologies or the uptake of existing technologies. So science and technology and mathematics and its many roles is utterly essential to the whole of fabric of society around us, and that's really why I'm passionate about this. The second reason I'm really passionate about mathematics is that legislation can solve a lot of problems, right? We have people um, solve problems, but you can't legislate cancer away. You'd like to say, I don't like cancer, you're illegal, but you can't do it. You can't get rid of Alzheimer's. And I'm living in a generation where 35% of the people of my generation will end up with Alzheimer's. I'd like to legislate that away. I'd like, you know, Jeff made a great point. What about carbon footprint? Well, we'd like, we'd like to just say, I'd like clean energy, please. But there's only one way that kind of problem is going to get solved. That's science and technology. And science and technology is increasingly uh, reliant on the underpinnings of mathematics. We have, we're talking about, for example, the life sciences, proteomics, and, uh, and so on, genomics, metabolomics, and they generate petabytes of data, and then they go, duh, what do we do with it? And unless you can process that data and, and link what you're seeing in hundreds of thousands of genomes to disease, you get nowhere. So mathematics, in, in the broadest sense, is becoming more fundamental and more important than ever before. And that matters a great deal to me, and I hope to everyone else in the room, because I'm telling you point blank that if we want to feed the world clean water, have, have abundant energy, there is only one way to do it. We have to solve technical problems, uh, and very hard technical problems, if we want the world to be a wonderful place. So that makes me passionate about it. And one of the things I talked about was that as a member of the uh, CST, I, I chaired a, a subcommittee which wrote a letter to the Prime Minister talking about robotics, automation, and artificial intelligence and the social and economic impacts thereof. And one of the things I recommended there was the creation of a, an industrial challenge fund, which Ruth is now running. So. I think uh, thank you so much. My yeah, opportunity to say thank yeah, you. And, and I think you've got a billion pounds now, is it? So it's, it's going to be two, actually, I think. It's, so it just doubled. Yay. No, no, four point, Are you serious? No, 4.7 billion was announced in the yeah. autumn statement last year. Right. So far, a billion pretty much has been allocated, right. but there is a billion yet to be allocated. And right. I'm quite happy to talk about some of the challenges oh, yeah, because yeah. I am completely with you Wonderful. that if we don't solve those... We won't help the UK in terms of prosperity, economic growth, exports, and just general well-being, as you, as you have highlighted. Fabulous. Well, a, a, a load on your shoulders to, to manage that well. But what, what, what I said is that it was a, a fairly long letter, but there are three paragraphs in there that talk about it. And what I said is, in America, they have DARPA. And it, DARPA is intended to give strategic advantage to the US military. And I said, what I would like to see is something that creates strategic advantage to UK industry. I want to see that we're driving things way up the TRL chain so it actually gets used. I don't want to see things like robotics in a lab, and it's nice, and they tinker, and it never, ever appears in anything that we actually do industrially. So that was the idea. And why challenges? I just want to talk about that. The first thing is because they work. DARPA set up a challenge to drive autonomous vehicles across desert, and nobody succeeded. The program manager came under a lot of flack for failing, right? He didn't fail at all. The next year, seven vehicles managed the whole course, and it kicked off everything you're seeing in autonomous vehicles because that was a great challenge. He managed to do the following things. One, it was competitive. A, a, a rude word sometimes in, in, in the UK, but you know what? I work a lot with the Olympics. I work with Formula 1. I think competition's great. And competition sharpens and hones the senses. Every two weeks, every single Formula One team produces a car that's faster. How cool is that? That's competition. Secondly, what makes a good challenge, a great challenge, 
is bringing together people who wouldn't normally work together. And that's why I want to highlight, that's, that's where mathem mathematicians should be, your ears should be burning, because you should be central and pivotal to every single challenge that ever gets raised. And if you're not involved in it, you are doing something wrong as a community, right? We're doing something wrong. Finally, there were two more things. The third thing was, I didn't want to see business as usual. If you just hand a load of money to academia, much as I love academia, EPSRC is intended to go to TRL3, so it wouldn't work. So I wanted to see something different. And, and, and um, actually, well, I've said four things, and that's really it. So I think mathematics is uniquely suited to this form of cooperative, challenge-based work where you need lots of people to get together. And I'm going to strongly encourage, strongly encourage everyone here to, uh, to please engage when these uh, two billion, I'm told, uh, potentially pounds actually start to get released. Thank you very much. Thank you. So effectively, you've answered the question, uh, or just introduced the question that uh, was discussed last night at dinner. What is the government's perception of the role of maths as an economic resource, which is uh, very much part of it. So uh, the, the plan is at this stage to have some input from the, uh, the, from the floor, and then we will ask uh, um, uh, two other questions by, by Dr. McKenna and Dr. Brazza. So are there any inputs on this question of government perception of the role of maths as an economic resource? Yes, please. I can recognize you. He's uh, the director of the IMA, is that right? Thank you for asking the question, Julian. So um, the Council for the Mathematical Sciences has written several times highlighting the, um, the results of government produced data on the cost of research divided by the um, government produced data on the value of the research that was produced to give us multipliers. And um, where that data came out, physics was of the order of 50, engineering and chemistry of the order of 200, and maths 588. So we have put that information forward and not had a very positive response so far. We've asked if the structure of the research councils is appropriate given that maths applies right across the board. Um, I think we, a lot of people in the room would probably say there's more to be done. Well, I, I think we all agree. <laughs> Please come in. So I, I might just talk a little bit about UK research and innovation Please. because you'll be aware that um, the Higher Education Reform Bill uh, was passed right before um, the election. Uh, which brings the research councils, Innovate UK and Research England, into one organisation called UK Research and Innovation. And I am really positive about the opportunity that gives us to be much more interdisciplinary. And when we talk about the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund and the challenges of which the first three have already been announced, one in robotics, one in uh, new batteries, and another one in innovative manufacturing for new um, pharmaceutical therapeutics, when, when we look at that, the opportunity to do interdisciplinary work right across the research councils and fund things where we get together and pull in the experts in, in the research council uh, space from, from academia, absolutely the best and most influential people that we can bring together. And from my team, from business, because we're the business-facing organisation, we have the networks into business, and to put those people in a room and have a deep dive on how to solve... That is my phone. A deep dive on how to solve a challenge, I think that is the way forward. And, I, you know, I just think we now have more opportunity than we used to. Yeah, don't worry, it's probably... I don't know. <laughs> if it was Phil's phone, that could be true. So could, could I just raise the issue as you're sitting there? I think there is a, a disconnect yes. between the mathematics community and you in Innovate UK. I personally welcome UKRI as a philosophy because it means we can connect mathematics in principle all the way to higher TRL levels. But at the moment, we've been bad at, at, at networking. The first tranche of money for the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is almost allocated or is th through 
as far as I understand, uh, only one mathematician has been to any of these advanced meetings. So we've, we've got a problem somewhere, and I think it, we need to find mechanisms for connecting us up. But I think it's a two-way process, and we need to find the ways that the mechanisms we have for the mathematicians to communicate with each other to the traditional industries needs to be extended beyond, and also we need to find mechanisms for getting into the into the early stage meetings about the next tranche of money and through to the 4.7 million. So thank you. That's Just yeah. Dub double team that one. Okay. Would that be okay if I uh, just I'll jump in a little? All right, bit? you do a bit, then I'll do a bit. And, yeah. and you can come in okay? too. It's not thank just you. about us. So, so I've got a few things that I, I wanted to write down, and, and you've kind of asked some questions that jump on it. So if I can go to the very first question that was asked, um, I'll give you my very brief answer to that one, if I may. I mean, in my opinion, EPSRC should triple the spending on mathematics. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think that uh, John Kingman um, has himself made the point, actually, at the LMS that he deeply understands how extraordinarily productive mathematics is and your value equation. The, and, and so that, that is actually a message received in, in a very good place. And so I'm going to intend to follow up uh, with, with that. In terms of the, the question that was just asked, so I've got a couple of things here, and I'm just going to say them, so then I think Ruth can, can sort of respond. But uh, one is, uh, what do I think uh, mathematics should be doing? I, I think you should be hooking up with a bunch of the networks. I mean, I've got here robotics and AI networks because they're really organized. I have pointed out on my little cheat sheet here that EPSRC and Innovate are actually doing really good work at creating networks. I think they're you know, doing excellent work. And we should be, as mathematicians, far more involved in, in branching out to those networks than we have been. They've been a little bit siloed in the past. The robotics folk, a little bit siloed. Um, you know, they didn't even talk about robotics and AI, to be honest, until that letter got written. Um, but now they're much more open. And um, so, so I would say that. And finally, I, I literally have written here, I would be delighted, I'm reading it, I would be delighted if Ruth and Innovate would be proactive in drawing mathematicians into challenges. Now, the reason I put it is, because what I haven't written here is, because mathematicians aren't salespeople. As, as a group, that's not really what we're so good at. And you can, you can either say, well, gee, then tough luck, or you can turn around and say, given that, okay, you're a bit like that, we'll make the effort to come to you. And I would love if Innovate UK um, would actually realize that there's a cultural barrier and be a little more proactive. And that's why I wanted to say first, because you can respond so, to all that. So, uh, we've got some okay. other questions as well. Can I so, just say one thing? Please. Very One very quick thing. Um, I, I agree with both of those, actually. And, and I do think the interdisciplinary nature of the challenge should really benefit the mathematics community. And getting mathematicians into those is absolutely critical. And we've done one round of engagement. We have not finished with pulling together the challenges. We've only just appointed interim challenge directors who are going to be a bit more DARPA-like. So there's a long way to go. Even though money's been announced, it hasn't been allocated. And there's a lot of work to be done still on who gets the money to do what. And it needs to be joined up. And it needs to deliver economic growth, because that's what it's for. Right, so we're still on this question of the government perception of the role of maths as an economic resource. Are there any other points from the floor? Yes. Perhaps you give your name, please. Uh, Tim Loynick, Chief Analyst at the Department for Education. Uh, in case people aren't aware, last week we published 32,000 lines of data on the me uh, median and upper and lower quartile earnings by university and by subject. And it may interest people in the room to know that maths out of 23 different subject groups was ranked fifth by average earnings of graduates five years on. So it's good. It's not as good as economics or medicine, but it is well above average. Uh, and people can download that entire data set if they wish. You can Google DFE statistical first release, and it's the third item at the moment because they're in order of publication. So, so that's a change, isn't it? Right? It's, it's risen from where it was five, ten years ago? Is uh, it's hard to know. This is the first time we've ever done it from tax data. So previously, it's been based on survey data, where universities ring up their students and say, how much do you earn? Uh, and we know 
there are a whole host of reasons why that may not be reliable. Uh, so in this case, we've matched it to tax data. We will be doing it retrospectively in due course to find out whether that has increased. Uh, the number is about 28,500 for the median income five years after graduation. And how, and how are you going to publicize this? Because that's, that's the point we were discussing today. Uh, well, I... Publicize this information. Yes. Don't so... Not it, just leave it in some website. Office. Oh, no, absolutely. And, well, we have a press office. The chief analyst doesn't cover publicity, as you can imagine. Uh, you should take these. Uh, you have to be slightly careful with these numbers because they are, of course, the average of the people who take it. And mathematicians are slightly more male than people at university as a whole. And we know men earn more than women. So you have to be a little bit careful inferring causality. So but this might be a role for the LMS or the IMA or... Absolutely. We're very keen for people to use these data, which, as I say, is why we've published and why I've seized the microphone to tell you all about it. Very good. I, I feel we should be using digital media, actually, in tweeting that information, because the people that you know, we interact with are much more interested in what they read on Twitter or Facebook than looking in a .gov um, website, unfortunately. So one of the next questions that we wanted to, and I would like to refer to, to, to Dr. Brazza, is how should industrial mathematics network globally, especially in Europe? And by the way, this afternoon, I was pleased to meet Professor Schilders of Eindhoven, who's here, and I hope he will intervene. But for Professor Brazza, would you like to sort of comment on this question? OK, thank you, Julian. Um, I think, uh, indeed, that um, networking about uh, industrial mathematics um, is a very important <coughs> issue. And uh, we have the example uh, in the last uh, uh, 30 years, it uh, gave uh, very fruitful advances uh, in uh, uh, industry innovation and uh, in many uh, practical uh, domains. I am more um, involved in uh, aeronautics, uh, turbulence fluid mechanics, and uh, I had the opportunity to see since the beginning of uh, creation of uh, European federative uh, uh, programs, uh, since uh, the FP2, uh, uh, FP3 uh, uh, framework programs uh, up to uh, growth programs and uh, uh, up to now Horizon H2020, uh, how uh, this networking, which was highly has been and uh, it is up to now highly promoted in Europe, uh, how it gave a substantial advancing in methods uh, by means of uh, applied mathematics for industrial pro problems. And I am giving an example. In the beginning of uh, years of 90s, uh, the aeronautics uh, companies uh, mainly uh, were using uh, the so-called uh, uh, elementary CFD codes by using uh, just uh, Reynolds uh, statistical Reynolds averaging steady state modeling. And thanks to this multidisciplinarity of mathematical methods uh, due to the wide partnerships of 40, 50 uh, institutes and companies sitting around uh, the table during these uh, European programs, we have seen a highly comp uh, increased competitiveness of uh, Europe by this cross-fertilization, uh, thanks to this uh, European uh, initiative. And in the last uh, years, as we all know, uh, Europe goes uh, uh, towards uh, promoting more uh, fundamental uh, research, uh, which uh, is now uh, represented by ERC, the European Research Council, among other, which uh, favorize excellence in Europe uh, in research and especially uh, uh, concerning mathematics. Uh, certainly, it is fundamental issues, but uh, at long term, uh, these issues can be industrially oriented, and uh, uh, we can see a major uh, added value uh, all these years uh, comparing to other countries which uh, do not have these schemes of uh, networking uh, at European level, uh, as, for example, uh, uh, during discussions with uh, my um, US uh, colleagues. In uh, US, uh, we have uh, um, links uh, among uh, two, perhaps uh, three partners or 
or institutes involved in uh, industry, but uh, not uh, these uh, wide panels of network. And uh, uh, this is uh, a matter of uh, uh, characterizing the US uh, uh, wish uh, of uh, uh, concurrence and competitiveness, where uh, in Europe it is uh, to reach uh, competitiveness and innovation thanks to synergy and not uh, to go against one another. So uh, we have seen this opportunity and uh, this uh, synergy gave a tremendous uh, innovation uh, in many disciplines uh, thanks uh, to uh, promotion uh, by this network of mathematics in many uh, sciences uh, oriented uh, industrial application. Are there, is Dr. Shilders here? Yes. Would you like to comment? Yes. Thank you very much. So my name is Wils Gilders. I'm the president of this new organization, EU Maths In, that was mentioned also by Paul Yort of ECMI. Um, yeah, so, so I think together we are strong, yes? So I mean, that, that is one of the reasons why we started this EU Maths In organization a few years ago. It is an umbrella organization. In each country in Europe, we have a, a national network that represents uh, mathematics for industry in the respective country. Uh, when we uh, did not have our organization yet, but we, uh, we sent a, a letter to Brussels uh, trying to convince them that they should regard mathematics as a key enabling technology. But we thought it was a wise idea to send this letter from different countries. Well, this had the adverse effect. I mean, uh, what they said in Brussels was, okay, this is all nice and we believe you, but uh, maybe you should organize yourself and... Uh, do things together. So that's what we did uh, in 2013. And uh, now we're gaining momentum, I think. I mean, um, last year there was a mathematics consultation in Europe. Uh, so Europe asked us to uh, comment on what mathematics is important, what topics we should concentrate on, what challenges we should uh, concentrate on. Um, we also organized a mathematics session on the ICT Proposals Day, so close to the people. Also, the Fed directors, they come and say, I think they accept that mathematics is very important. And uh, what we are trying to do now, and uh, there will be several workshops this year in Amsterdam, next, uh, the 7th of July, the first one will be in Amsterdam. Um, we are trying to aim at creating a European technology platform for MSO, Mathematical Modeling Simulation and Optimization. So I think if we do things like that, then we can, well, we have to organize the mathematicians, they have to do things together, and, uh, well, it, it looks as if this is going to be successful. I mean, so people from Brussels, they cooperate with us, they listen to us, they, they support what we are saying, but indeed what you were saying, I mean, it's, um, the mathematicians should also, I mean, it's a two-way process. I mean, on the one hand, people from the applications and from industry should ask us to cooperate, but also the mathematicians, they are sometimes reluctant to, uh, to do this. And uh, so I think this is very important. So we should work on both ways, on the mathematicians and on but the people using the mathematics. We have to recognize the fact that the UK is uh, leaving Europe, uh, leaving the European Commission um, Council, and, and, um, but they can still participate. Of course, UK, uh, one hopes they will. But it means that in order to have financial funding, it will no longer come from Brussels, and hopefully it will obviously come from, uh, uh, from, from, uh, from London. Um, but that's something that is where we have to keep, yeah, keep, I hope keep that discussing. Will, um, because, I mean, as we saw today, I mean, I think there's a lot of tradition here in the UK. I mean, so the study group started here, and several other things uh, were initiated here in the UK. So. I think it would be uh, very bad if we don't have you on board anymore. So I mean, it's one of these uh, networks. This one on which I helped start uh, in in '89, the Europe, ERCOFTEC, uh, European Research Community for Flow, Turbulence, and Combustion. And that actually, the headquarters is located in London, but but there are there are 27 special topic groups. I mean, these are areas which uh, which focus on very sp special areas and, and have been. So I think it, it is important that the mathematical community here today should realize that they've got to keep working hard and, as it were, keep pressuring government uh, to enable us to make best use of our European context. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the problem. 
Are there any other uh, points from about the European dimension? So now I'd like to move on to this other question. Which okay. Um, I, I give a lot of talks, sit on quite a few panels, and the phrase that I like to end with is that the future belongs to the integrators. And when I talk about integrators, I mean satellite data being used for agricultural improvements, or I think about virtual reality being used to help um, practice with robots to decommission nuclear power plants, or perhaps um, modelling to produce real-time animation, such as next week the Tempest, the, um, the Royal Society production of the Tempest, is having real-time animation of, um, I think it must be fairies or something like that, produced by Imaginarium, a small company that was a small company when Innovate UK first started them. So when I, when I look to the future, it's all about integration. And I was saying that to my colleagues who are the chief executives of the research councils, and one of them said, oh, I thought you were talking about calculus. Well, today I am, actually. <laughs> because that is really what underpins so much of this. And my question is, is this working? Are organisations, large and small, at the maths economy interface, working as well as they should? My question to you, and, and I'm really interested, actually, in, in what you have to say about that. Questions, some, some suggestions. Yes. I heard so a no what, earlier. I, I picked that one up. Other <coughs> thoughts? Well, but when you think of, say, organizations, I mean, obviously you think of businesses and you can think of uh, um, non governmental organizations and uh, universities. Um, some, sometimes these are all in separate, separate boxes, aren't they? And, and, um, question is, do we have the, the right organizations at the moment? Um, I think we probably do, but we just need to get them to energize, as it were, um, uh, energize more. Yeah, there's a, some Professor Champney, I think. It's, yeah. Hi, I'm Alan Champney from the University of Bristol. Um, a number of us have, have, have been involved in setting up, and Philip Bond is chairing, this review of knowledge transfer in, in, the, um, in the mathematical sciences. And I think Really, the whole purpose of the review is to answer that question. The reason you got silence was people, and, and people looking at their shoes was, uh, in, when you posed the question to the audience, is partly the nature of mathematicians, if I can talk in terms of stereotypes, uh, which perhaps I shouldn't, um, particularly as it's typically a male stereotype. Um, but but it's secondly, actually, we don't know. We don't know. We, we've heard today pockets of evidence. We've heard quite a few different examples of things that have been spectacularly successful. And if I can characterize the nature of them, they are all different. Some of them are, you know, like um, um, Professor Brazier, the, the, um, the, Brazier, the, the um, big uh, government-funded industrial partnership, you know, long-term direct support. Some of them are little projects. The, the, the Dyson, it was one tiny project that kicked off their belief in mathematical modeling. We don't know. And I think, uh, uh, in answer to your question, one of the really good things is that we are now gathering the evidence. And hopefully by the end of the year, um, early in the new year, we should be able to know, and Philip and, and his team on the board should be able to distill those. And I hope, um, for this community here, that we can then back those recommendations. Sometimes the mathematics community, in my view, can be guilty of shooting itself in the foot by saying, oh, don't forget about my bit of maths, like every community can, but perhaps we're not good at seeing ourselves as a national resource. And I hope um, that Philip's report comes up with some definite um, examples of good practice, some <coughs> fantastic recommendations for the future, and then we can all get behind it. Thank you very much, Alan. That's very helpful. There's a nice French uh, example of, of, of um, advertising. Um, I have to say, first of all, my, my, my wife is a landscape architect, and she was involved in the restoration of the, uh, uh, of the um, Hampton Court Gardens. Uh, and that's advertised in a very British way. You must come here, because Henry VIII went, for his, went there for his honeymoon again and again and again. <laughs> and, 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 and so I'm always very worried, because Japanese visitors stand on the edge of the tube and scratching their head, and I always think they're going to, be, they're going to fall in the t under the tube because it's British humour. But, but, but in France, uh, <clears throat> they're using the tube to advertise science and technology. Uh, and uh, you've got a budget now. Perhaps you should do the same. They have a marvellous one there. Of, uh, tell, us, tell us the story of the, 
Oh, the advertising. Well, CNRS uh, this year had uh, created a um, uh, gigantesque fre fresco. Fresco, yes. Thank you. Sort of. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, sort of. Uh, in the um, corridor of correspondence, the long corridor of correspondence in uh, Montparnasse station in Paris with um, 13 uh, big. Uh, posters uh, with uh, selected uh, innovation uh, um, themes, uh, all uh, with bottom line theoretical research, fundamental research, uh, in which uh, mathematics were highly involved. So um, many people have seen this and uh, um, colleagues, uh, and not only colleagues, but uh, people who are not involved in uh, science uh, said, oh, we have seen in the walls, on, on the walls of Paris, uh, exciting things about uh, science. I, I was not uh, involved, uh, I, I was not, uh, um, I, I had not known that uh, these things exist. Now I think that uh, our society advances quite well. And this was a comment from people who have nothing we, to do we, we, We'll, we'll send you, I'll ask her to send you the, uh, Sounds the marvelous. picture. Sounds absolutely this is marvelous. biology, this is biology and mm. engineering and flight and so on. Yeah, anyway. um, yes, mm. Robert. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's a, a problem of time scales, at least this is personal experience. So I had a um, TSB project, which was the pre <coughs> predecessor of Innovate UK. And uh, by the time I'd worked out what the issues really were, uh, we got to the end of the project, and also the company had been taken over by another company, and they weren't interested anymore. So that one didn't really lead to a, a useful outcome. And then another project I have um, had with National Grid, uh, they terminated for failure to deliver on time, and I think they just didn't understand that I was busy developing what I think is a good idea, and uh, uh, they lost faith in me. So I don't know how to deal with these, and maybe it's just my, my own uh, ineptness. But. <laughs> well, you're rather keen on timetables, aren't you, in your Innovate UK projects? Well, but well, we are, because it's public funding, and we yeah. have to make sure it's properly spent. But not all ideas work, and that's been my experience, clearly your experience as well. But that shouldn't stop any of us from having another go. Yes, please. Question at the back. Normally, it's a yes. you write from the Pennines, don't you? Uh, <laughs> yes. Sorry, um, Paul Glendening from Manchester and Edinburgh. Um, I think this question of risk is really important that sort of comes up. That mathematics has, there's a danger that in any of these sort of bigger, for example, industrial strategy things, mathematics is asked to provide a service. So we're told what, what is wanted, and whether the question is then whether we can deliver it or not. I think there's an extra element that when mathematics really works, it does something disruptive and interesting and different and new. But there's always a very strong element of risk there. And I think that's possibly why you get mathematicians looking at their shoes. Because they know that they can't guarantee things, but when it works, my god, it works. And so it's how you balance that thing of maths can deliver a basic service and can do that you know, fairly effectively, versus giving space for maths to do something genuinely new. I don't think anything that I've heard sort of suggests to me that that second option is really something that we know how to, how to develop and how to articulate, <coughs> and whether there's even the space for that in current thinking. Can I jump in that one? Yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a very good point, and I thank you for making it, and I thank Robert for making his point too. I think it's an excellent point, and, and it's actually a very serious point. It is not a trivial thing. I know how fine a mathematician you are. Mathematicians have many things to do, but nevertheless, it, it is simply not trivial to deliver original thinking to a tight agenda, as, as some of these budgets are. And, and, and I genuinely think that we should follow up on that which is part of our knowledge review, I'd be delighted to speak to you about it because, it, because you are certainly not the only person in the world uh, as a mathematician who's ever run into that problem, I can assure you. And I think that as a community, we actually do need to come up with a solution. Um, in terms of, of risk, 
Uh, I think one of the one of the things I hope to see in the challenge fund, um, and this is just my personal hope, is is that there is a reasonable level of risk, and and that's one of the reasons I chose DARPA as a model. Perception of DARPA as risky, I think, is misfounded. But to give you the the numbers, 70% of DARPA projects are considered to be successful, and 30% fail. And some people, you know, I've spoken to people who say, "Gee, that's." That's an awful lot of failures, and, and, and ironically enough, they're typically people in life sciences, and I'm like, how many medical t things do you test that actually work 70% of the time? You're telling me every time you try a new drug out, 70% of them work right, yeah. I mean, in fact, it's, it's actually a very high success rate, but the fact is that, that you know, a lot of stuff fails. So you need to have the right tolerance for risk, and I, I think that goes right to the very, very, very top. And that is why DARPA... Uh, allows a degree of independence and an understanding and acceptance, as well as tight controls and management, and, and kill projects fast if they're not working. But you, you need a, you need to do, as I say, business differently. If if you want to do these things, business has to be different. That's the point, and I, I really genuinely hope that what what we're doing now is going to give a reasonable scope to that kind of thinking. That David King, is it David King in the back? Yeah. Who is that? Hi, thank you, Julian. I'm David Kingham from Tokamak Energy. We're definitely a company that's doing something differently. I mean, we're really setting out to tackle this huge problem of fusion power. Uh, and we want to engage with mathematicians. We do successfully do so. And um, part of the key to this is acceptance of risk. Now, we're trying to tackle a whole series of really challenging problems in a slightly different way to the conventional fusion programs. Not very different, but slightly different. But part of the difference is to look at what mathematics can do to help us initially solve some problems that are going to have to go into hardware eventually. So to us, mathematics, although the risk of a project can be high, it's actually a low-risk way of addressing a really difficult challenge. And, and I think you've been successful in getting Innovate UK funding. Is that not correct? Uh, yes, I can acknowledge we've had... <laughs> three... well, and I think you have mathematicians in the room here who might want to have a conversation <laughs> about how they could help you with your challenge. Yeah, I think we might be the first company who, who won one of each type of SMART award when it was first administered again uh, by, by Innovate UK. Well done. <laughs> uh, sorry, the man in front of you... I think he was the DreamWorks man. Hi, yes, Lincoln Wall and DreamWorks uh, Animation. So uh, if you recall the diagram that Robert Lees put up about the uh, you know, technology um, uh, maturity model, I think w we, we fall into the problem of thinking about the relationship between mathematics and impact as moving horizontally along that line. And that is the time scale issue that you refer to. And any government program looking for outcomes, economic outcomes, is operating on the wrong time scale for traversing that distance. But companies innovate in a different way. They innovate vertically. In other words, they have established um, maturity models from basic understanding, software codes that are in operation, industrial processes that, are, that, that characterize their current ability to deliver product or productivity. And innovation occurs across that entire horizontal line. So if you have a government program that is focused on having an economic impact, you have to make sure you invest in complete chains. And that means you either have to have an organization that is linking the mathematics to the outcome, or the company itself actually has to have that, complaint, that, that chain in existence and have people innovating in concert across the entire spectrum. So there's two forms here. One is from basic understanding to exploitation, and these are the big, the big challenges, and that can, be very, um, that can be very impactful. But the other form of innovation, which is much faster and is on the, 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 the order of days or weeks or months, is to innovate across the chain and link the mathematicians with the software coders, with the operational people, and with, the, uh, and with people that can implement a change in the process in the business. Yeah. yeah. Another question. No yeah. disagreement from me. <laughs> Dougal Goodman. Yeah. Thank you, Julian. I'm Dougal Goodman from the Foundation for Science and Technology. First of all, the Newton Institute many years ago had pictures on the tube of mathematics 
which was a very successful communication medium. But I've also been very involved for many years with the insurance industry, facilitating projects to meet their needs. Part of the resource we had available for that project was devoted to facilitating within the companies what the question was, to help them articulate the question so you don't have the mismatch that we heard a moment ago with about National Grid. We have to devote a proportion of the resources available to us, which is part of Ruth's resources, not to research programs or innovation programs, but to facilitation within companies to help them set out what the questions they're seeking to answer. I'm glad you mentioned the service industries, actually, because that's 75% or such of, of the GDP in the UK. So it's a really, really big part of our economy. And, and actually, there's a huge opportunity there with insurance, modelling, the sort of things that um, cyber can do to shore up those industries. I think there's a big opportunity in understanding the challenges and working on those. I, great suggestion. Thank you. I really should have put that on silent. I'm so sorry. I'm the only person in the room that can't turn their phone off. <laughs> right, there's another question. From the back. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Rich. Um, we've heard a lot of talk and suggestions about what mathematicians could do and should do, and I certainly don't disagree with many of them. But I would just comment that if you want people to do something, you must put in place a structure that rewards them for doing what you want them to do and not punishing them. Um, I suggest that the current system of institutional and personal rewards for mathematicians in universities does not actually encourage them to do most of the things that we've just been agreeing we want them to do. Can I, That's the panel. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, so my, my view on that is actually if it's better to recruit a willing volunteer who wants to be part of a project and is passionate about it than try and persuade someone to do something that they don't actually want to do. And that's why I am so um, keen that with the challenges, as we're talking about here, we get the people in the room who have something to offer to solving that challenge. And it's not a matter of having somebody who, you, who provides a service or who is bought to buy a piece of the work. It, it's really about working together as a group to solve something and I would hope that mathematicians who really are engaged in wanting to be able to do something better in an area where they have interest whether that's a you know it's a social challenge it's an industrial challenge it's a it's a creative and entertainment challenge are willing volunteers and partners that's the way that I would like to see it and then the question thereafter is how do we make sure that they're able to make that contribution. But not everybody is going to want to be part of a challenge. Some people will be really well served by developing a very pure part of mathematics that the UK is going to want and need in the future. I think there's room for everybody, but I, I don't think it's a matter of paying more or trying to, um, you know, trying to buy uh, expertise. I think it's about engaging the willing to do the best they can. Well, I, I'm going to jump in and say that I, mean, I agree with, with, with the desire to have enthusiastic, engaged people, but um, there, there are structures in universities that reward you for publishing papers and doing a lot of other things that may not um, align well with the, these issues of challenges. And I think that you're right, you know, if, if one or two billion is going to be spent on these, I think that, and we want the best people to really get engaged. Um, I think that is a very good point, and I thank you for it, Richard, that we, we need to make very sure that if people get engaged in these things, that, they, that, that this is seen well. And, you know, in the U.S., again, uh, I'm, I, I repeat, the DARPA model is something where going off to DARPA and coming back, if you're from a top university, is very well seen. It is a, it is a promo career promotion um, for you. Um, you know, they know that you're going to come back having picked up a lot of skills. And so that's one of the reasons it works so well, is that that alignment 
between industry and academia has been very carefully thought out. So it's not just about money for sure, but people care a lot about their careers. And, and, and so I think that you're raising a great point, and I, and I do think that we have to be very careful to think that through and get it right. Can I just say one of the, uh, we've almost gone beyond, but one of the questions which was raised last night was not, not only the role of mathematics um, as an economic resource, but the, the other way around, that industry uh, can, help can help the building up of, of, uh, of mathematics. Um, and um, so many industries obviously do have local programs, they help schools and all sorts of other things of that, of that sort. And uh, um, I think that's so that people can see that doing mathematics you know, leads you into jobs and, and so on. Um, so um, well, we have one more question here, then I think we've, we've run out of time. Uh, hi, I'm Colin Please from uh, Oxford University. Um, I've, I've heard a lot about uh, disruption, uh, integration, and uh, uh, high risk. Uh, those are things which I think are very important for uh, mathematicians to be involved in. Mathematicians are able to provide something which can really be ris uh, disruptive, but is inev inevitably high risk. There, I, the difficulty I see is that mathematicians are not natural salesmen. Uh, we don't naturally go out going and seeking uh, to do such things, and many of the mechanisms you, that are set up uh, invariably go and are provided that are good for established groups that are in an area and so forth. Trying to make the mechanisms so that the disruptive nature of math mathematicians, their high-risk uh, uh, behavior that can go and give you innovative ideas, needs to be put together in order that you don't end up something that is very much um, uh, small steps forward rather than something that's completely new. Right, thank you. Yes, Hillary. Hillary. We have many women on the floor. Um, I'm Hilary Ockenden, um, and I'm from Oxford. Um, I'm just a bit disappointed that this conversation seems to me to have got quite negative, given this very... Um, upbeat and successful meeting that we've had all day. <laughs> and I want to say that I think there are quite a lot of things that we're doing at the interface that we might mention. The one I know about is the Smith Institute, which I think is being very effective at exactly this interface. And I think there are several others that are doing similar things. And I really think we ought to think about developing those models and not moan too much about um, the difficulty of you know, mathematicians being pathetic people who can't go out and... Um, <laughs> so I would like to end on a more positive note. Very good. And Very good. say, let's follow... Um, there are things going on, and I think we should... Um, and so we've we're seen done. them all day. Here, here. Yeah, here. We've done that well. So I think we should finish and uh, thank particularly the, the organising committee and the chairman of the committee, namely John Offenden, uh, it's been, I think, a very successful day. And, uh, and uh, maybe he now is going, what's going to give us a little lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be very quick, as you can imagine. I'm as thirsty as anybody here. Uh, <laughs> I've been absolutely overwhelmed by the day. Thank you very much, all of you. It's been an absolutely unique event in my lifetime. Uh, and I just hope that it uh, will not just stop here and that this sort of thing will continue in the Royal Society and throughout the UK and Europe and the world. And um, I'm particularly looking forward to Philip Bond's report, which I've never seen a report about mathematics which has been passionate, but now we're going to have one, I hope. And I hope it'll be as, um, as influential as was the Lighthill report of 1968, and it would be a wonderful new, new stepping stone for maths and industry. Um, now, the reception, I just would like to say, Hillary's kindly mentioned the Smith Institute. I think it is a fantastic institute, almost unique in the world, at being right on sort of TRL four and a half or whatever it is. Um, and it's very, they're very kindly, they are hosting the reception this evening, and they will be one of those numerous stalls that you'll be able to see down there and 
you'll be able to talk to them how they work. I think um, the, the new CEO, Heather Tewksbury, is going to be there. And uh, I think that that is something I feel that the Smith Institute is just just starting at that, in, there are vast opportunities at that interface which we must follow up and bridge the TRL gap. But um, can, I'd like to really also thank Alex Halliday and his team without, and, the, and his program, which I call Industry Innovation, not Science Technology. Um, and I think this has been a real step forward for the society. And as I say, I hope, let's hope it will continue to something else. So let's thank Alex. And also, I think Julian has done. I, I mean, it, are you as effective at this in the House of Lords? <laughs> 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 but can we also thank Julian and his team who have done a great discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.